Section 2.5, Continuity. A function f is continuous at a number a if the limit of f of x as x approaches a is equal to f of a. We say that f is discontinuous at a, or f has a discontinuity at a if f is not continuous at a. So in order to meet this uh, condition of continuity, we have to uh, basically meet three things. The limit has to exist in order for it to be equal to the value of the function, and the value of the function has to exist, so the function has to be defined there, and then the two values have to be equal to each other. Let's use the graph of the function f to determine the numbers at which f is discontinuous. Okay, so it looks like if we look at one, there's a hole over there at x equals one. So the uh, function is not defined there. So that means there's no way that this could equal the value of the function because the value of the function doesn't even exist over there. So f of one is not defined. And that implies that f is discontinuous at 1. Okay, it looks like we have another potential problem at 3. Because at 3, even though the function is defined, the limit as we go to the left is equal to the value of the function, but the limit as we go to the right is not equal to the value of the function. So that means the limit at 3 does not exist. So if the limit doesn't exist, it definitely can't be equal to the value of the function. So the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x does not exist. So that implies that f is discontinuous at 3. For our last one, uh, it seems like f is defined at 5. And it looks like the limit from the left is equal to the limit from the right, so that means the limit is also uh, exists at 5. However, the limit does not equal the value of the function. The value of the function is much higher than the limit. So the limit as x goes to 5 of f of x does not equal the value of f at 5. And that implies that f is discontinuous at 5. So you can see that there's a lot that can go wrong potentially when looking to see whether a function is continuous. Okay, where are each of the following functions discontinuous? First, we have f of x equals x squared minus x minus 2 over x minus 2. Well, we know that uh, if a function is not defined, then it definitely can't be equal to the value of its limit over there. So it looks like this thing will be undefined when the denominator is 0, which is when x equals 2. So f of 2 is not defined. So that implies that f is discontinuous at 2. OK, for the next one, we have a piecewise function. 1 over x squared if x is not 0, and then 1 if x equals 0. So it looks like it is defined even when x is 0. However, if we look at the limit of f of x as x goes to 0, Let's see if that actually equals the value of this function. So the limit of f of x as x goes to 0. Well, as we go close to 0 but not equal to 0, we're only dealing with the top rule because the bottom one applies when x actually equals 0, which is uh, a value we don't look at when we take limits. We only go nearby. So this thing will be 1 over x squared near 0. Well, the limit of 1 over x squared near 0 does not exist, as we've seen. Remember, that's uh, this graph-looking thing. It just blows up. It becomes infinity.
So this limit does not exist. So if the limit doesn't exist, it can't be equal to the value of the function. So f is discontinuous at 0. Next up, we have another piecewise function. Again, this one is defined even at its, uh, uh, even at two where it would normally be undefined. Looks very similar to the other example we did. So let's see if this one actually fixes the uh, continuity issue. Because it's defined, we have to just check the limit. So let's look at the limit as x goes to two of f of x. Well, near two, that'll be the top rule. So that's the limit of x squared minus x minus 2 over x minus 2. OK, so let's uh, factor the top. It's the limit of x minus 2 times x plus 1 over x minus 2. The x minus 2s we can cancel because we're not looking at x values equal to 2. So there's no possibility of x minus 2 being 0 over here. So we get that this limit is just the limit of x plus 1 as x goes to 2, which we can evaluate because it's a polynomial. So we get 3 by direct substitution. OK, so the limit of this thing exists. The value of the function exists. But the value of the function at 2 is equal to 1, which is not equal to 3. So the limit as x goes to 2 of f of x oops, is not equal to f of 2. So even though we have the limit existing and the function uh, existing, the function being defined, because the limit doesn't equal the value of the function, f is discontinuous. At 2. So even defining it there didn't save it. Okay, let's take a look at our old friend, the greatest integer function. This thing, remember, is also called the floor function. And if we look at a graph, remember what this does is it chops off uh, any decimals after a number to return you to the integer that's below but closest to it. So like 0.9 becomes 0, uh, 2.6 becomes 2 pi becomes 3. So if I look at this, at 0 it's equal to 0. It keeps going up until it hits 1. At 1 it jumps up and becomes the value 1. Because before, like 0.99, whatever, it goes down to 0, but the second it hits 1 it jumps up. And so on. Uh, we could have a couple negative values too, why not? Maybe just one. Okay, so if we look at this uh, coming in from the left, we hit uh, this value. Coming in from the right, we hit that value. You can see that those don't match, so the limit from the left and the right don't match for any integer. Any number on the x-axis that I've written, 1, 2, 3, 4, that I pick, if I go from the left, I go from the right. As I approach 1, 2, 3, or 4, the limit's not going to exist. And the same thing for every other integer. So the limit as x goes to n for f of x does not exist for any integer. So for any value of n inside the set z of integers. Because uh, the limit doesn't even exist, there's no way it could be equal to the value of the function. So f is discontinuous at every integer n in c.
Okay, so a function is continuous from the right at a number a if the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the right is the value of the function. It's continuous from the left at a if the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the left is equal to the value of the function. Pretty much exactly what you would expect. So let's look back at our greatest integer function now. In which directions is the function continuous? Well, let's look at it from the right. The limit as x approaches n from the right of f of x for every integer, because the only potential issues are at the integers. It's clearly continuous elsewhere. Well, let's look back and see. As we approach from the right, we go to the value of the function over there. So that means that this thing, which is equal to the limit as x goes to uh, n from the right of the greatest integer function, it is equal to n, which is the value of f of n. So that's wonderful. So that means that f is right continuous. at every integer. Let's look at uh, left continuous. Well, we would expect to have some sort of issue here because we saw that it's not continuous. And similar to limits, if its uh, continuity doesn't match in the right and left, we would expect that it's probably not continuous in general. So if these did match, we would expect it to be continuous. Let's take a look. We're going in from the left. It looks like over here I approach zero, but the value of the function is sitting up here. So you can see that as we approach from the left on any integer, we approach an undefined value. Or we, and it's not really undefined because it is defined above. So we approach the, a value that's not the value of the function. So this limit. is equal to the previous integer. It's the one below it. So instead of approaching n, it approaches n minus 1, which is 1 less than the value of the function at n. So it's not equal to the value of the function of n. So even though the limit exists and the value of the function exists, f is not left continuous, which is what breaks continuity in general. Okay, we say that a function f is continuous on an interval if it is continuous at every number in the interval. If it's only defined on one side of uh, an endpoint in the interval, we understand continuous at the uh, endpoint to mean continuous from the right or continuous from the left, depending on which side it's defined on. Let's show that the function f of x equals 1 minus the square root of 1 minus x squared is continuous on the interval from minus 1 to 1. OK, so this function is not defined beyond uh, minus 1 to 1 because the square root of a negative number cannot be taken. So let's look at this just within the interval first. So if a is between minus 1 to 1, let's look at what the limit would be. So then the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to the limit as x approaches a of 1 minus square root 1 minus x squared. and the limit of this uh, difference is the difference of the limits. So the limit of 1 is 1. So I'll just move this to the limit of the square root. So this is 1 minus the limit as x approaches a of the square root of 1 minus x squared, which is 1 minus the square root of the limit.
Okay, but that's a polynomial, so we can use direct substitution. And uh, that's just f of x if you plug in a, so that's f of a. Great, so that's continuous on the open interval from minus 1 to 1. So we just have to check the endpoints. Like we said, f is defined, uh, if f is defined only on one side of an endpoint, we understand continuous to mean continuous from the right or continuous from the left. So we just have to check continuity uh, from the right for the left endpoint. Because it kind of looks something like this. And we're at minus 1 over here. So continuous in the left. Sorry, so we want to look at this as we go towards this thing from the right. So that equals 1. By the pretty much same reasoning as before, you can just plug in and you know, did limit, pass it through, and you're going to get that it equals 1, which is equal to the value of f of minus 1. And similarly, if you approach 1 from the left, you get that it equals 1, which is the value of uh, f of 1. And I'm cutting out a little bit of work here, but it's the exact same thing as what I wrote with the Value, uh, limit of f of x as x approaches a, so it's not worth redoing. Alright, so that means that we have it working for the open interval from minus 1 to 1. We have it working at the endpoints, so our definition works all the way through, and f is continuous. On the entire interval. The closed interval. If f and g are continuous at a and c is a constant, then the following functions are also continuous at a. The sum, the difference, the uh, constant times the function, the product, and the quotient, assuming that g is not uh, 0 at a. Uh, you can prove all of these, assuming that you can prove the limit laws, which you know requires some epsilon delta work, so we're not going to do those right now. but. Um, we can look at the first one of these. All of these are pretty easy if you have the limit laws. The limit of a sum is uh, just the sum of the limits. So that fact alone gives you that uh, the limit of f plus g will be the limit of f plus the limit of g. And by continuity, those are both equal to the value of the function. So those both become f of a and g of a, so that becomes f, of g, f plus g of a, which is exactly what you wanted to prove, that the limit of the sum is equal to the value of the sum. Okay, uh, furthermore, any polynomial is continuous everywhere, so that's continuous on the entire real line. Uh, any rational function is continuous wherever it's defined. So it's continuous on its own domain. Okay, these can be proven using the previous theorem. If we have a polynomial, it's some constant times x to the n, another constant times one previous power, all the way to you get to just the constant at the end. Okay, so we know that the limit of x to the m is a to the m by one of our limit laws. So that means that the function x to the m is continuous. The limit of a constant is a constant by another limit law. So that tells you that the uh, constant function is continuous. So it means that the product is continuous. And it's a sum of all these products, a polynomial. This is a product, this is a product. So that's it, it's continuous. You just do one law after another. 
um, because rational functions are quotients of polynomials, and we just proved that polynomials were continuous, then that means that rational functions must be continuous in their domains. Okay, so the cool thing about this is before we were doing a direct substitution, in order to uh, calculate uh, limits of polynomials and limits of rational functions, if we have continuity, then that's equivalent to direct substitution for any function that's continuous. So we can just start plugging in to evaluate limits instead of having to go back and use all these different laws that pass limits through every single time. Okay, so this thing is continuous. If we let it be f of x. So it must be equal to the uh, value of f of minus 2. So that is minus 2 cubed plus 2 times minus 2 squared minus 1 over 5 minus 3 times minus 2 which is just minus 1 over 11. So having rational functions is great, assuming that the number you're approaching is inside the domain. Notice if you plug in minus 2, it's not undefined. If it was undefined over there, we would not be able to uh, just do some substitution because if it's undefined, it's not continuous. But rational functions are continuous in their domains, so this was great. Okay, we have a whole bunch of other types of functions that are continuous in every number in the domains, polynomials, rational functions, we already did, but we also have root functions, trig functions, inverse trig functions, exponential functions, and logarithmic functions. They're all continuous at every number in the domains. We're not going to prove all the other ones, but we are going to use this result. Okay, let's do some examples. Uh, where is the function f of x equals ln x plus tan inverse of x over x squared minus 1 continuous? Let's look at each piece of this function. We know that ln of x is logarithmic, so it's continuous on every number in its domain. So that's all positive numbers for logarithms. All right, let's look at tan inverse. That's continuous everywhere because tangent can take any value. So our, uh, tan inverse is defined on every value. And let's look at uh, x squared minus 1. Well, it's a polynomial, so it's also continuous everywhere. So in all real numbers. Okay, so that means that the only potential problems are um, negative numbers, because natural log is not defined for negative numbers. Also not defined for zero, so we can't have negative numbers, we can't have zero, and we can't have any number that makes the rational function undefined. So that means we can't have something that makes the denominator equal to zero. So we cannot have one. So these facts imply that f is continuous on the intervals 0, 1, not including 0, not including 1, and all of the rest of the numbers from 1 to infinity, not including 1 or all the numbers greater than 1. Okay, let's evaluate the limit of sine of x over 2 plus cosine x as x approaches pi. So the smallest that cosine could possibly be is minus 1. So the smallest the denominator could possibly be is uh, 2 minus 1 equals 1. So that's wonderful. That means that the denominator will never be equal to 0. So if the denominator is never zero, uh, sine and cosine are uh, trig functions that are continuous at every number in the domains, which means that they're continuous everywhere. So that means that this function, this quotient, is continuous everywhere. So this thing 
must if we let it equal uh, the limit as x approaches pi of f of x then that means it must equal f of pi by continuity so we can just plug in pi and sine of pi is 0 cosine pi is minus 1 but it doesn't matter because we have 0 in the numerator and not the denominator so that becomes 0 Okay, if f is continuous at b and the limit of g of x as x approaches a is equal to b, then the limit of f of g of x, the composed function, is equal to f of b. So what this means is that if you have the limit of a composition, you can stick the limit inside of the function on the outside. So we move the limit inside. So that's really cool if you have continuity that that works. Okay, so the proof looks worse than it is, but it's because it's an epsilon delta argument, and you know those aren't maybe the funnest thing in the entire world, but it's really not that bad. Because f is continuous at b, that means the limit of uh, f of y is equal to f of b as y approaches b by the definition of continuity. The limit of the function is equal to the value of the function. Okay, so by the definition of what a limit is with the epsilon delta definition, that means that uh, for every epsilon, if the absolute the distance between y and b is less than some delta value, then the distance between f and the limit is less than epsilon. So in this case, this limit is l. That's this l over here, f of x minus l, and this delta one is delta. We're going to use delta 1 because we're going to save delta for later to use it. So we want to just have an extra delta floating around. Okay, so that's our uh, first fact used. We said that the limit of uh, g of x equals b. Sorry. We said that f is continuous at b. So the value of the function at b is equal to the limit of f. Now we're going to use the second fact. The limit of g of x is b. Because of that, we have another epsilon delta argument. We could say that if b is the limit now, then the distance from g of x to that limit b must be less than some epsilon value. But remember that by definition, that has to work for every single possible epsilon value. The, in the game, they can choose any epsilon they want for you to find a delta smaller to make it work. So that means that it has to work for an epsilon value of the first delta that we picked, because it works for every possible epsilon value. So it includes that possibility. So we, we play a little bit of a game over here where we, um, instead of just saying it's less than a general epsilon, we say it's less than that delta one. So that's taking the form of the epsilon in this case, which is why we wanted to save uh, delta to be like a legitimate delta. Okay, so if we let y equal g of x in the first statement, then we can start with this. If this thing is true, then we have to get to this thing being true, right? But we just let y equal g of x, so that means that it means that thing is true, right? Because we just said that this thing implies that g of x minus b is less than delta 1, so that implies y minus b is delta 1 for y equals g of x, which means it implies this is true for y is equal to g of x. But if this thing is less than epsilon, then the limit exists by definition. So the limit of the composition must equal f of b. But uh, b is equal to the limit of g of x. So we just proved it, what we wanted to prove. 
Okay, so it's uh, maybe it takes a little bit to wrap your head around it, but I think if you read it a couple times, you'll see that you follow from this step to this step, which leads you up here, which leads you to your final result, which is exactly what you wanted to prove. You just have to do epsilon delta twice. So you have to have um, this delta becoming this epsilon, which is, I think, the confusing part. Anyway, let's just use this fact. If we have the limit of a composition, which is continuous, then we can just throw the limit inside of the function. So let's start using that. Okay, so if we're taking the limit of arc sine, which remember is sine inverse of one minus square root of x over one minus x as x approaches one, well, arc sine is continuous. So that means that we can throw the limit inside. Okay, so that's arc sine of the limit as x goes to 1 of 1 minus square root of x over, well, we want to try to cancel out 1 minus square root of x. We know that 1 minus x could be factored as a difference of squares if we take x to be a square. So that means we take the square root of x in each of these. Okay, so that cancels out with 1 minus square root of x because we're not looking at this at equal 1. So that means we get arc sine of the limit as x goes to 1 of 1 over 1 plus square root of x. That's all that's left. Okay, now we can just plug in because the 1 plus square root of x is uh, continuous, although maybe you want to pass through the limit if you're not convinced of that, but regardless, it'll be arc sine of a half. So that's pi over 6, because sine over a half is pi over 6. Okay, if g is continuous at a and f is continuous at g of a, then the composite function f of g given by f of g of x is f of g of x, or f composed of g of x, f composed of g of x is f of g of x, is continuous at a. Since g is continuous at a, we have that the limit of g of x as x approaches a is equal to the value of the function g of a. Since f is continuous at g of a, we have that the limit passes through by our previous result, so we pass through the limit. We use this over here inside to say that this equals g of a, and that's it. f of g is continuous. All right, so that's super nice. The fact that we can pass through a limit implies that composite functions are continuous. OK, so now since we know that composite functions are continuous, if we write functions as their composites, we can show continuity. Let's do an example. Where are the following functions continuous? If h of x is sine of x squared, then we can write this as a composite function. f of g of x. Where will let g of x be the inner function, so the one inside is x squared? And will let f of x be the outer function? So that's sine of x. Okay, let's look at where g is continuous. Well, it's a polynomial. So it's continuous everywhere. f is a trig function. So it's continuous everywhere. Okay, so our composite function must be continuous everywhere. Okay, next up, let's see where this thing's continuous. Well, 
we should split this up into uh, ln and 1 plus cosine x. Remember that ln is defined whenever its argument is uh, positive. So that means this thing is defined when 1 plus cosine x is positive. So f is defined when 1 plus cosine is positive. Okay, so that implies that it's uh, f is not defined at any value that's going to make 1 plus cosine x uh, equal to 0. Notice 1 plus cosine x can never be negative because cosine can never be smaller than 1. So 1 is as small as you can get, so 0 is as small as you can get. So this only happens when cosine is minus 1. Okay, so remember where is cosine equal to minus 1? Well, that's it. Uh, pi or uh, 3 pi or 5 pi, etc. Any multiple of pi, minus pi. So that means that f is discontinuous at any uh, odd multiple of pi. We can write an odd number as an even number 2n plus one more number that makes it odd. So any odd multiple of pi for numbers n and z, the set of integers, and it's continuous everywhere else. Okay, so last but not least, the intermediate value theorem. Suppose that f is continuous on the closed interval a, b, and let n be any number between f of a and f of b, where f of a is not equal to f of b. Then there exists a number c in the open interval a, b, such that f of c is equal to n. So what this is saying is that if you have um, two values of your function, and you have a number in between those values, then your function will be equal to that number in between your values somewhere. So let's show that there's a root of the equation 4x cubed minus 6x squared plus 3x minus 2 equals 0 between 1 and 2. In order to do that, we just have to show that, um, that f is below a root and above a root between 1 and 2. Because if it's uh, below a number and above a number, the intermediate value theorem says it has to hit every number in between those values somewhere. So let's let f of x be equal to 4x cubed minus 6x squared plus 3x minus 2. For intermediate value theorem, we want to go from 1 to 2. So let's let a equal 1 b equal 2. We want to find a root, which is a fancy way of saying we want the function to be equal to 0. So we want n to be 0. Okay, so let's look at what f of 1 is. Well, plugging in 1, we get 4 minus 6 plus 3 minus 2, which is minus 1, which is negative. For f of 2, that's 32 minus 4 plus 6 minus 2, which is 12, which is positive. Okay, so that means that the value 0 sits in between f of 1 and f of 2. And we know that f is a polynomial. So that means it's continuous everywhere, so it's got to be continuous on that closed interval from 1 to 2. Our intermediate value theorem says if the function is continuous on the closed interval and we're looking for a number between two values, then that number must uh, be equal to the value of the function somewhere. So the intermediate value theorem is definitely going to imply that 
there exists some number c in the open interval from 1 to 2 such that f of c is equal to 0. So the intermediate value theorem says that there is an x value that's going to match up to the y value you want in between any two y values. So that's the same thing as saying that f has a root there. The x value that makes the function 0 is the root. So f has a root between 1 and 2.